The other type of friction we're going to talk about is kinetic friction. This is also called sliding friction, and it occurs when two objects are sliding past one another. Kinetic is from a Greek word, I'm pretty sure, that involves motion. So you might have heard kinetic energy is the energy that moving things have. And if you're hyperkinetic, it means you can't stand still. So if in a homework problem you're told that something is already sliding, the type of friction that you're going to use is kinetic friction. But sometimes you might have to use maximum static friction, or FS max, to determine if something will slide or won't slide. And this is the type of friction equation that we're going to use if we determine that all other forces are greater than the maximum possible static friction force. If that happens, then the thing, whatever object it will be, will be sliding, and the friction force on it will be kinetic friction. Like static friction, kinetic friction is always parallel to the two surfaces in contact. But unlike static friction, the direction of kinetic friction depends on the velocity of the object sliding. In, ge in general, kinetic friction will act in the opposite direction of the moving object. But like static friction, kinetic friction is dependent on the normal force and the sliding friction coefficient, or the coefficient of kinetic friction, and that's pronounced mu k. Interestingly enough, the sliding friction only depends on the normal force and mu k. It does not depend on the velocity, nor does it depend on the acceleration of the sliding object. If the object is sliding, regardless of its velocity and regardless of its acceleration, um, well, to the extent that the acceleration doesn't influence the normal force, um, sliding friction only depends on the normal force and this coefficient of kinetic uh, friction, which um, presumably somebody has measured with a force meter, like they've determined sliding frictions for various surfaces. Um, it'll be a different number, this mu k will be a different number uh, for any two, two surfaces in contact. For example, uh, I think uh, I might have told you that mu k of around 1 will be if you have very, uh, very good traction on your tennis shoes and you're skidding to a stop. Mu k of 0 0.01 is if you happen to be standing on wet ice. Mu k of 0 0.01 is, is very, a very slippery surface. This equation is different from the equation for static friction maximum because the Fs max equation in the previous video told us only the maximum possible static friction force that could, uh, that static friction force could exert, and um, it's quite possible that static friction force would be a number less than that, and that depends on the other forces on the object. However, if we're given that the object is sliding, we know that the amount of kinetic friction force will be the force given by this equation. Namely, if, if somehow we know that the object is sliding, whether we have calculated that it is sliding or whether they have told us an object is sliding, we then know, if we know the coefficient of friction force and the normal force on that object, we know what the kinetic friction force has to be. So notice in the previous video, if we calculated the maximum static friction, we still would have to know other things about, well, is it just about to start sliding? Then the static friction force is at its maximum. But if it's not just about to slide, the static friction will be something less than the maximum amount that it could be. In sliding friction here, if we're given that it is sliding, it can only be whatever number is given by these two values. There's a gross joke I want to tell you about um, the coefficient of sliding friction or the coefficient of kinetic friction. I didn't make it up, but I, I'm going to tell you so I bear full responsibility for it. Um, so this is actually pronounced mu k, and my joke would be is like, if you are really sick, I think it might be flu season now, and um, you were really sick, and all kinds of fluids were running out of your nose. You had very different kind of 
uh, you have three different colors of mucus coming out of your nose. Together, all three of those different colors of types of mucus would be as a group called muk for the plural of mucus. Yeah, that's pretty funny, huh? I'm I I know I know I, I'm sorry. In order to use kinetic friction, we first have to know the direction an object is sliding. And we have to know the direction the object is sliding is because uh, once we know that direction, the direction of kinetic friction will be opposite that direction. So often we'll draw the velocity of an object off to the side or above or below the object because we won't, we won't, we can't draw the velocity touching the object because remember that in a free body diagram, only forces can touch the, the object. So once we're given that the velocity of a sliding object is to the right, we immediately know that the kinetic friction force is to the left. If the object is near the Earth, gravity pulls down on the object, and if the object is sliding on a level surface, the normal force pushes upwards on the object. Notice that the uh, free body diagram is clearly if the object is moving to the right and the uh, kinetic friction force is to the left, the object must be slowing down, and that's generally, on almost every circumstance, what sliding friction does. Sliding friction almost always slows down uh, the sliding object. So in this case, we would choose the x-axis in the direction of the acceleration, um, and the y-axis happens to be vertical. This isn't always going to be the case, and like I said, oftentimes the axis will be tilted, but since the acceleration in this particular free body diagram is in the horizontal direction, um, the x-axis should also be in the horizontal direction. Just like in Chapter 5, once you have a properly drawn free body diagram, the rest of the problem is pretty straightforward. We'll write F net Y equals M A Y, and our only two Y forces is, are the normal force and the force of gravity. And we've specifically chosen the X axis to be the direction of acceleration. The reason why we do this is so the acceleration on the Y axis will be zero, and that will generally simplify our math. That's actually why we pick the X axis to be the direction of acceleration. So specifically we can set a y equals zero. And not surprisingly we'll get normal force equals the weight of the object. And we need to know normal force because normal force is in the equation for kinetic friction. So notice we used the f net y equation uh, specifically to find normal force. And the reason why we had to find normal force is because normal force was in our equation for friction, but friction is an x-axis force. So now we can write F net x equals max, and typically um, we're trying to solve for the x-acceleration. And in this particular example, we can, only, we can see that uh, the only x-axis force is sliding friction. And we get this result, so the equation for sliding friction is mu k m g, which we found from the y-axis force. And now we put in our x-axis equation and we see that the mass conveniently cancels on both sides. And whoops, I just noticed that I neglected to draw in plus and minus on my x-axis. Usually I pick minus to the left, so what I should have done is put minus f k in here, then I'd have minus mu k m g, and I've got minus mu k here. Um, and so this is a typical example of, of sliding on a horizontal surface. Now, notice that the problem could get a little complicated. Maybe they'll, they'll add uh, some other forces in the x direction and some other forces in the y direction. If there's another y force, you just add it underneath here in the f net y. And so normal force will have maybe some given y force. So it might not be as simple as this. But it's going to follow the standard pattern. Whatever the y forces are, you just add them underneath all the y forces. And you still are going to solve for normal force because you need to know the normal force to find friction coefficient. If there's other x-axis forces, maybe there's a rocket or something making it go forward, 
then we'll put the rocket force right here under F net X, um, and you'll get an extra term in here, but it's still going to work pretty much the same way. The next type of problem I want to talk about is an object sliding down an incline. So now it's not on a horizontal surface, but it's, it's uh, sliding down a hill. So remember, um, gravity points straight down on the object. Normal force now is perpendicular to the incline. So here's the incline. Normal force is perpendicular to that. It's not always going to be straight up. It's, to find out the direction of normal force, you have to look at the surface that the object is on, and normal force will always be perpendicular to that surface. So here I've drawn the sliding friction coefficient because it's given in the problem. Somehow I know that the object is moving down the hill. All right? So the object is moving down the hill. And so here I want to choose my x-axis in the direction of acceleration and since the object is moving uh, along this angle of the hill, I need to choose my x-axis in that direction. So the x-axis has to be parallel to the hill, making the y-axis perpendicular to the hill. So there's x and there's y. And then it becomes clear that if I know the angle of inclination of the hill, if I look at my little vector diagram for gravity, this angle is going to be congruent to that angle, and I figure that out just by looking at the picture. So before I forget, I'm going to choose up to the right as the positive x direction, and up to the left as the positive y direction. And I can go ahead and fill in my uh, y component of the force of gravity, and the x component of the force of gravity. And maybe I'll draw in the fact off to the side that this object is actually sliding downhill. And once I have my free body diagram drawn, then the rest is pretty straightforward. All I'm going to do is I'm going to write F net Y equals MAY. And notice I have only two Y forces. There's this normal force that's along the Y axis and there's this component of gravity that's the, along the y-axis and those are my only two forces so I just fill the, them in for F net Y and I've specifically chosen my axes so AY is zero which allows me to solve for the normal force and the reason why I need the normal force is because that's what I need to know for the sliding friction force because FK equals mu K times normal force so in fact I have the friction force is equal to mu k mg cosine theta. So usually in these problems I'm going to write f net y equals m a y and um, in order to find the normal force because I need to know the normal force because that allows me to find the friction force and once I, know an, uh, once I have an expression for the friction force here, then I can write my x-axis equation. So notice here's my uh, friction force, which is in the positive x direction. And my only other x-axis equation is this mg sine theta. So I have fk minus mg sine theta equals mgx. Notice this time I remembered to put my plus and minus sign, and I knew that mg sine theta say theta points downhill and fk points uphill so that's how I decided that this was positive and this was negative. So from the y-axis I got fk equals mu k mg cosine theta and notice that conveniently the masses cancel out of every term and I can easily solve for the acceleration on the x-axis. I'm going to leave it here um, because I could also, all, some of these problems also ask you to find what mu k is or possibly even uh, ask you to solve for uh, cosine or sine of theta. Maybe, maybe there's a way to get tangent theta in there. Um, but this is a typical, typical thing. Now, the other thing I should, should tell you that's important is let's say I get a negative number when I go and plug, they tell me what mu k is, I know what g is, cosine theta. Notice, because of this negative sign, depending on the value of mu k, 
the x acceleration could be positive or negative. It, and the x equation really can be positive or negative. Notice that this object could be moving downhill. If it's moving downhill and it has a negative acceleration, that means it's moving downhill and it's accelerating downhill and it's speeding up as it's going downhill. That's what a negative acceleration means only because I chose uphill as the positive direction. So, but also, what if I have a really big friction coefficient, sliding friction coefficient? It's quite possible that the acceleration comes out to be a positive number. What that means is the object is moving downhill, but the acceleration is uphill. What that means is the object is slowing down as it's sliding downhill. Both cases are possible, and in fact, it's strictly depending on how slippery the hill is, and that's mu k. A low mu k is a very slippery hill. A high mu k, like close to 1 or 1 1.2, is, is a very sticky hill. So things can move downhill, can be sliding downhill, and they can either accelerate downhill, which means they speed up, or they could move downhill and accelerate uphill, which means they slow down. All right, so, um, and if you have, and so that's strictly dependent. I, I look at this acceleration and I see it's a positive number, but then I have to look at my picture that I've drawn. I already said uphill was the positive direction. That's how I tell that if this is a positive number, my acceleration is uphill. Because I have to look at, I had decided that uh, uphill would be the positive direction. It's totally legitimate to decide that downhill is the positive direction, and then you have to look at your picture, and, and if, if you have an uphill acceleration and you have chosen downhill as the positive direction, in this equation, if you have an uphill acceleration, you get a negative number. It's totally okay. Um, as, so you have to be able to decide whether the acceleration on, in this circumstance is uphill or downhill, depending on the sign of your acceleration. And... Um, you may differ in sign from maybe a, my solution set that I posted. I, I posted the solution sets on Blackboard already. Um, if you have a different in sign for acceleration, that's totally okay. Um, but if I got the acceleration was uphill and you got the acceleration was downhill, that's probably a mistake on, on either your part or my part. All right, so the only thing I want to leave you with is the only difference in this picture is that uh, if the velocity were to start out uphill in this problem, the f sliding friction force, it, everything would be the same, except the sliding friction force would be pointing downhill instead of uphill, and that would mean there would just be a minus sign out in front here and out in front here. That's the only difference. Um, so on the problem supplement, you're going to work a problem like this. Um, and uh, what's actually going to happen in one of the cases, uh, this problem is going to uh, slide uphill and slow down and stop before it slides downhill, or it's going to stop before it gets stuck. And then you have to decide using static friction maximum whether it slides uphill and stops, or whether it slides uphill and slides back downhill, right? And the key is, this mg sine theta, if it slides back downhill, this mg sine theta must be bigger than the maximum possible static friction. If mg sine theta, as a number in newtons, is smaller than the maximum possible static friction, then um, the thing will slide up and it'll get stuck and static friction will hold it in place at the top of the hill. If mg sine theta is less than the maximum possible static friction, the thing will slide up, stop for an instant, and then slide back down the hill. So that's kind of an interesting thing uh, for you to be able to do, and I think it's going to be a laboratory exercise in the near future.